good evening. Today I'm standing in front of you as a, as a student of Miami University rather than a teacher of UWC. And that is because uh, I want to share with you um, one of my research that I did on effectiveness of um, environmental education. I've been a student for a long time and, and a teacher too, but often I've felt that the impact environmental education could have in our society has not been as much as we expected. So I did an extensive research, um, collected samples from people around, from around 33, 34 countries, and uh, I realized that the results were very surprising. And today I'm going to share that result with you and make a case for why I'm giving you this talk. Uh, before I proceed further, I would like to do a small research right here uh, so that we all can get into the content properly. May I have the lights on, please? Thank you. Uh, you are free to participate or not participate. It's not binding. Uh, it's optional, uh, but it will be very nice uh, if you participate actively. Uh, is your hand you use these products or have used these products? Thank you. What about these products? And this one? I have been using a lot, I know. <laughs> what about this? Anybody has escaped this? At least one. How many of you post at least 10 foot on social media? What about five? Twice more. Raise your hand if you have gone to school, college, or university for your education. Have you gone to a school, college, or university for your education? Some of you may be in school, some may be in college, some may be in university. Keep your hands raised if you studied environmental science or environmental studies or environmental scholar. Thank you very much. My research is over. I'll get back to you with my results right now. The importance of environmental education was felt sometimes during late 1970s, close to 78. Since then, many countries have integrated environmental science or environmental studies or environmental systems into their curriculum. And very surprisingly, if you look at the state of the environment after 1978, you will see increased amount of carbon dioxide, increased amount of pesticides, increased amount of inorganic fertilizers, and all those bad things, deforestations. Then one wonders, why? Is it because of the actions of the people before 1978? Maybe true. If that was the case, then it has been close to 30, 40 years now. 
why the educational system that was implemented after that has not been able to control or provide some remedy. That is where my question comes from. Before I proceed further, I will tell you how the research is to find the impact of environment or environmental education is done so far. Researchers go and ask people, do you do this nice thing about the environment or do you do not do nice things about the environment? This is called self-reporting. And people generally tend to act smart and look nice. They always say, no, no, no I, I always do the good things. So very often the data we get is full of flaws. The second type of research is, as a researcher, I go and I closely observe people behaving in different, different ways. Then I, I see, okay, they are behaving responsibly or irresponsibly. I did a couple of observations in this college also, but I'm not going to tell you what. Um, or people use a camera to observe people. But the research that I did was a bit different. I was not watching them. I was not asking them straight questions. I was asking them questions like I did now. And the answers were very different and surprising. Let me show you why. If I tell you that the things that you have been using is not biodegradable and not recyclable. And I ask you, are you using this? Then you will be thinking, no, I'm not going to raise my hand now. Because that's bad. And if I ask you this, that whether you eat chicken or vegetable, if the vegetables are grown, industrial, in an industrial farming, they might be using large amount of inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, water, as much as they use for growing chickens. So you won't be making that much of a difference. If I tell you that the fish that you eat, thinking that you are not really eating red meat and causing harm to the environment, those fish might be being harvested beyond their sustainable yield they might be posing a real risk to our nature. So our fizzy drinks, they use groundwater. And the most dangerous, what we don't know about these things is, all these products produce or contain microplastics. We have learned about micro microplastic very recently and we have learned and we have we are scared because there are tons of them in our environment. But then what shall we do? We'll talk about that a bit later. Social media posting. Every time you post a photograph, you retrieve it, rewatch it, share with someone. <coughs> it consumes energy. It produces carbon footprint and if you keep it there without deleting them you are continuously producing carbon footprint without your knowledge and now if I were to ask you the questions again will you be equally enthusiastic to raise your hand may not be because now you know what is good and what is bad. So this is, this is the difference of research that I did for my, my studies in Miami. And how do we explain this? Why people behave very differently, even though they have very good intention of doing good things. My research is based on an almost 50-year-old theory called theory of plant behavior. This theory was proposed by a very famous scientist who is still alive and still working with his friends and researchers, 
uh, co-workers and he has extended his theory which was most probably uh, at the initial stage helping a behavioral scientist but now it is being used for educational curriculum. He himself is involved in one of the research and that is from where I got my impetus. Let me explain you this theory in a very simple way. Our behavior is influenced by our intentions and control factors. The control factors in the photograph, I showed you toothpaste, detergent powder, medicines. I mean, we, now we know that they are harmful, but can we really stop using them? We, we just don't have any choice. So these are the controls which, which defeat our intentions and they result in a behavior that we want to change but we are not able to change. Those are called factors, external factors and other than that there are three other elements that affect our intention. One is called attitude. I may have a positive attitude towards the environment. I will say, okay, no, everything I do, I must think. If I'm posting a Facebook photo, this is going to cost energy and I'm not going to do this. Some people might think, it's okay, it's just one photograph. It's few picovolt of energy. It's not that much. But imagine, five billion people, picovolt of energy, every second amounts to a lot. Do the math. Subjective norms are the behavior or the norm that we adhere to by being inspired by people around us. We see nice people, they are doing good things. We also say, oh, I will also do good things. But when you try to do, you have a little bit of compromise. Okay, If you are uh, using plastic straw or not using plastic straw, I will use less. So I actually set myself with a particular norm which is comfortable to me because we tend to be in our comfort zone. <coughs> that actually influences my intention and behavior as well. Perceived behavioral norms. These are things that one imagines that, okay, I know that the doctor told me that you must do exercise for half an hour. You are a heart patient. But then, I don't, okay, I, you know, I, I know that, I know I must do it, but I don't have time, I'm busy, I've got a lot of work. So I just console myself, you know, I have a good excuse not to do the exercise. People also think like that when they think about environment. Isaac Eisen and his group have been working on this theory. They expanded this to educational research and they found out that we need to really think about the curriculum because our curriculum are not getting the result. But their data were collected in one of the three ways that I described. And I collected the data in a very different way. This is why we both differ from each other. There have been many extensions to this theory. And one of the theory that I will give you example is coming from defense research. They found out that if we can sensitize people, students, with the threat, the vulnerability, and the risks, we can get better results. Because of this, many institutions have started teaching environmental science as experiential learning. They take them for a field trip. They take them for a semester-long uh, uh, expedition somewhere. But what happens there is their assessment is not actually done the same way as the curriculum is being modified. The assessment is back to square one. You have paper one, paper two, paper three to write, then you get a grade which is in one to seven scale. Students go to those fun trips for fun. They think it is fun but they are not really availing those opportunities as opportunities of learning. Here, this particular research was done to see compliance of cybersecurity law. They found that if people know how dangerous it is to expose yourself to cyber crime, then they, they obey the law much better. 
can we develop a curriculum that can really sensitize people, it can let learners know the danger of not behaving well about environment. That is what the case I am making. Can they know what they can do and not do by really doing it during their learning process? Before I, I go further, I'll tell you a small story. I went to a particular country. Um, I was taken for a tour. Um, where, uh, a friend of mine, his father-in-law, took me for a tour of the university and he was showing me the nice places of the university and he was disgusted to see that how the university has changed over 50, 60 years since he was a student there. It has become very um, unhygienic. There is rubbish everywhere. And he comes back in the evening, we meet with one of his friends and he narrates the same story. And the friend just laughs at him, he says, why are you worried? We are going to live for four or five years. Let this generation suffer, they are the ones who didn't take care of it. But that was the moment of reckoning for me. Shall we go on blaming the generation before us or the generation of the future, okay, this is their problem, let's not worry. This is why I am asking you to think and think whether we need to reframe our curriculum. If your answer is no, I leave it to you. Enjoy the future. If your answer is yes, then start thinking. If enjoying environment, enjoying natural resources, enjoying the bounties of nature is considered to be our right, why should environmental education be an option? It should be compulsory. And why the responsibility of getting educated in environment or environmental science should rest on school? I think everyone, the community, the parents, the children, me as an individual, should be responsible for learning that. And that's the case I'm making. And I leave you with that thought to ponder. Thank you.